Hello, welcome to another edition of Everyone Has a Story. My name is Herb Howard. I am filling in for the brilliant brother, Mr. Marcus Jones. Shout out to Marcus Jones, who's done an excellent job with this show for the, over 10 years. He's transitioned now to more of a role behind the camera, producing and, to, and directing, and he's tapped me to fill in, and I'm um, very gracious to have the opportunity. My guest today is Mr. Paul Vallis. Um, among many things, you are currently a mayoral candidate for the city of Chicago. How are you doing? I'm fine. One of many candidates. One of many <laughs> candidates. So we're looking forward to seeing how that's going to shake out. We'll certainly get into some more of that as we go on with our conversation. But give the people a little bit of background. Who is Paul Vallis? Well, first of all, let me just say that usually I'm better dressed, but uh, we just had a march on the west side. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and if I slur my speech just a bit, it's because I, I have an open... Um, um, I have a broken tooth, so the, it's touching on the nerves. So That's I, I very just wanna, painful. Tooth I just want to qualify that. I, don't I want know the to, tooth pain is as painful as any other pain I don't pain want you to think I'm going straight to the dentist <laughs> after that. But, you know, I was born and raised in Roseland. I went mm -hmm. to three public schools. Uh, I'm the grandson of Greek-American immigrants. We lived in a two-flat in the Roseland community, born in Roseland Hospital. And uh, my entire public service life has been public service. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, my, my entire life has been public service. Um, I, I spent time in the service. I was 13 years in the National Guard. I worked for the state legislature for many years. Individuals like Phil Rock, Don Clark Nash, Emil Jones. Before coming to work for the city for 12 years, I uh, was city revenue director for three years, revamping the scandal-ridden revenue department. I then took over the city budget in the 90s during the good years when we were balancing budgets and we had police officers, an adequate number of police officers in, uh, in every community. Terry Hillard was the police uh, commissioner then, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and when we were balancing budgets without raising property taxes, I might add, a and then of course in 1995, uh, uh, I took over the Chicago Public Schools, which at the time were called the worst in the nation, and I ran the schools for six years. So I built 78 school buildings. I left the school district with one billion dollars in, um, in in cash balances. I raised test scores for six years. I. Uh, um, we never closed a single school. Our enrollment actually grew by 34,000. The district then had 70,000 more students than it has today. Mm -hmm. and, and it was really the golden year uh, for, uh, years for the school system. I then challenged the political establishment by running against Rob Ogorovich, uh, and I only lost by one and a half percentage points. And then of course, when I left, uh, after that election, I went to rebuild schools in Philadelphia. I was charged with rebuilding the, the uh, New Orleans public school system after Katrina. And then I've done international work. Uh, the devastating uh, uh, earthquake in Haiti that killed 230,000 people. I've been to Haiti about 40 times and in Chile. And I even, even spent a little time in Sudan. So I, uh, my whole life has been public service. And, and I come from a family of public servants. Uh, you know, there, in my family, there are six veterans. There are, are, are four police officers. One uh, deceased was a Chicago police officer. He, he, you know, he, he, he died of natural causes, my dad's brother. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, three teachers and, uh, and one firefighter paramedic. So everything about what we've, uh, what, who we are as a family has been, uh, uh, have, has been public service. So that's my, that's my background. But I'm running because I really think that the city is heading in the wrong direction. 
you know, I think the Emanuel administration has been DC politics at its worst. They don't know how to manage, they don't know how to budget. They're, what they're best at is pay to play. What they're best at is, uh, is uh, vengeance against their political opponents. They're masters at winning elections, but they're not um, masters at governance. And if you look at the city of Chicago today, it's really becoming a tale of two cities. The downtown area and that, that growing radius outside the downtown area is thriving uh, and it's prospering. But yet you have uh, the majority of our 77 communities are, are struggling. And on the west side of Chicago and the south side of Chicago, I mean, it, it's, it, you have depression-like conditions. You know, I, I was in the you know, I was on the other Michigan Avenue the other day. That's the Michigan Avenue in Rosen, Michigan Avenue on 113th Street, mm -hmm. walking up and down. And and not only are not quite the magnificent mile. That's right. That that's right. And not only it, it you know it's it, you know it's the long neglected mile. And not only are there very few stores that are occupied. Um, I, I, I mean, we did our shopping, our clothes shopping at Gately People Store. I mean, that's been shuttered for what two decades. But not only do you have vacant lots or abandoned property, and and and, and uh, probably a majority of the uh, of the storefronts that are unoccupied, but you don't even have <laughs> you don't even have fast food places, you, mm -hmm. uh, let alone restaurants. You don't even have fast food joints. Think about that for a mm -hmm. second. <laughs> you know, think about that. I mean, is that not a reflection of deep, deep depression or what? Yeah, if you can't get McDonald's to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you, you've got a real problem. And it's not because we, we don't have the resources, we do. And it's not because uh, we don't have the energy and the smarts and the creativity and the innova innovative ideas to, to transform and to revitalize those communities. We have that talent. Uh, it simply hasn't been the priority of the political establishment. Mm -hmm. It simply has not been. And when you neglect whole communities, not for one year or five years or 10 years, but for decades, I mean, it's, it's political malpractice, and, and that's what we're facing. And, and what's happening now is, do you realize, you know, we look at the downtown area and, and we see the, you know, the skyscrapers. Mm -hmm. You know, they're building more multi-story buildings than ever. So, mm -hmm. so much for the two flats. Now it's condominium complexes that are 30, 40, 50 stories high. And, uh, and, and you would think that, my God, the, the wealth in the city is growing. The wealth in Chicago has actually declined by 17% when mentioned by property values. And when you look at the, the north side or you look at the downtown, you say, how could that be? Look at all the high rises. It says valuation. When you, when you can look at that 17% reduction in, assessed, in, in the value of your property since the 2008 recession, what that means when you look at the growth in the downtown area is that there are communities where there's been a decline in wealth as measured by property values by 20, 30, 40 percent. And that's deep, deep depression. And you see it. When you go to the south side of Chicago, depending on who you're talking to, and 30, 40 percent of the men on the street are in, are, are, are uh, you know, uh, have been incarcerated, uh, you know, and they're and they don't have the adult ed or occupational training skills mm -hmm. or services to get them back into the economy, back into the workforce. Mm -hmm. That is sheer neglect. That is sheer neglect. If you're just joining us, we're being joined by Paul Vallis. He is mayoral candidate for the city of Chicago. Got some background on you growing up in Roseland. We certainly know about your experience as the CEO of Chicago Public Schools. That's where I were, was most um, familiar with you. Whitney Young. I, yeah, I was a graduate of Whitney <laughs> Young. Um, shout out to Whitney Young for sure. But actually, when I was in eighth grade, I went to eighth grade at Bryn Mawr, which mm -hmm. is on 73rd and Jeffrey mm -hmm. in South Shore. It's now called Boucher. Mm -hmm. And um, I was actually in the first graduating class after they changed the name to Boucher. And you came to speak at our graduation. You were the keynote speaker. I don't know if you remember that or not, but you were the keynote speaker at our graduation um, in year 2000. And so I remember you from there. And, and you talk about trying to rebuild the schools. That's something I want to get into. Mm -hmm. and I want to get into some other things as we talk about your candidacy for mayor. We're going to do that as soon as we come right back from break. We'll be right back. National Mavericks.
me it's about what it represents. You know what I'm saying? Nothing more, nothing less. That's where I'm from. You know what I mean? It's only right. You don't know what it feel like Hold up, I'm talking real life Late nights in the stoop Praying this shit gon' take flight Made a sacrifice These dreams bigger than you believe Looking at my seeds They getting older They got needs But look at me Still hoping this music shit bubble Knowing I can cop me some work And get back on the hustle But that's trouble sometimes I think it's worth the risk My girl hate when I say it But yet and still I reminisce But that's the twist When you trying to make an honest living Devil on my shoulder I can hear him whisper propositions Consequences for my actions When I give a hell Had to be when I was in the county He's trying to make bail Sitting in that cell like damn how I get here When I was just a friend It's in a whole nother atmosphere But that's life ain't it Take the bitter with the sweet I'm still in May V You niggas know me I'm different, I live it, you ain't never did it My brown eyes seen a lot underneath this cubs fitted Ambitious and driven, Joe I'm trying to get it Dream another million underneath this fucking cubs fitted I'm different, I live it, you ain't never did it My brown eyes seen a lot underneath this cubs fitted Ambitious and driven, Joe I'm trying to get it Dream another million underneath this Yo, fucking cubs fitted It's a nigga better than Jordan that didn't catch his break And he don't got the fortune and fame but is he still great? Was that his fate or did he drop the ball when he had a chance? Then again God laughs when a man plans Dreaming from the stands in the nosebleed section That's my worst fear, so I study life's lessons Count my blessings even though I'm far from my goals In the eyes of my kids, gotta be a hero No ego, I know I'm humble as they come But at the same time, my nigga, I am second to none Numero uno, used to be a duo Cut that nigga off cause he was playing in his Juno Pause, a nigga wanna be broke, you gotta leave him be They ain't none of my business, I'm sipping on this green tea Still in May V they know how I'm rocking, ain't shit change. I'm trying to keep some dollars in my pocket. I'm Stop. different, I live it. You ain't never did it. My brown eyes seen a lot underneath this cubs fitted. Ambitious and driven, Joe, I'm trying to get it. Dream another million underneath this fucking cubs fitted. I'm different, I live it. You ain't never did it. My brown eyes seen a lot underneath this cubs fitted. Ambitious and driven, Joe, I'm trying to get it. Dream another million underneath this fucking cubs fitted. I used to want a gold chain and a pair of Jordan 4s. These days I want more, yeah, that's what I'm coming for. If you ain't trying to score, then what's the sense of playing the game? If you ain't got the drive, my nigga, then stay in your lane. The pictures I paint, know I'm making Jean Michel proud. The artful dodge, you know you see my Basquiat crown. I done been down, came up, lost it all again. Hustle don't mean shit. If you ain't got the heart to win, I'ma be up again. My spirit say I can't lose. Don't make mistakes twice, know they watching how I move. Praying on my downfall, flip flop, round off, always land on my feet. It's like I got cat paws off. Jack Frost, I'm the North Pole God. A lot of Niggas be spitting, but they ain't fucking with moi. And now I'm merchant on my granny grave. I ain't never been afraid. Flow like water, can't brush me off. You gon' catch the wave. Out of the grave, and they were all great. And they were all thrilling. And they were all dramatic. Too bad we couldn't have had a victory to men of heaven. But that will come. Sure as God may green apple someday. The Chicago Cubs are gonna be in the World Series. Cubs fit it. Cubs fit it. Cubs fit it. Cubs fit it.
Welcome back to Everyone Has a Story. I am Herb Howard, your guest host for the evening. We've been joined by Mr. Paul Vallis. He is mayoral candidate for the city of Chicago. Before the break, we were talking about some of the things that you're running for, some, I mean, some of the things that are a part of the platform mm -hmm. as you prepare to run. You talk about having so many candidates. Tell us what things, some of the things that set you apart. What are some of the things you're running on, specifically if we can start when you're talking about rebuilding the schools? It was something that you um, had a vast experience with. Schools have taken a bit of a hit over the past few years. How are you going to plan to build the schools back? Well, besides being the tallest candidate, okay. Okay. I'm joking. And I actually think I'm older than Willie Wilson, so I may be the oldest mm -hmm. candidate too. No, you know, I think what's going to set me a, a, apart is I've always been a problem solver. I've always been a crisis manager. You know, every job I've taken has been an institution in crisis. Scandal at the Revenue Department, 1990. City and financial crisis, 93s. Schools, the worst in the nation, on the verge of financial collapse in 1995. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia, on the verge of bankruptcy, state takeover in 2001. Louisiana, New Orleans after Katrina, after the devastating Katrina. So how do you build those things back up? Well, my approach is to, first of all, my approach is to tackle the issue and, and, and to recognize that there's a connection between budget and finance and effective programs. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I build a long-term financial plan that is an investment plan. Mm -hmm. You see, it's all about investing. I mean, the reason we're a city that's declining is we're not investing. What are we not investing in? We're not investing in our public safety. I mean, when you allow the police, uh, police vacancies to grow to 2,000, when you don't provide mm -hmm. training, when you don't provide, uh, uh, when you decimate the supervisory ranks, when you decimate the detectives ranks, so that we're only solving one out of six murders, you know. I mean, when you're not providing, when you you don't purchase tasers, when you don't have the command and control, that's disinvesting. You're not only going to have problems with increasing crime, but you're going to have problems with accountability. When you don't invest in your schools, when you steer 50, 60 million dollars in no-bid contracts to uh, uh, corrupt vendors, uh, some of whom result in, you know, uh, a superintendent going to prison, uh, you know, when you close 50 schools and then you turn around and you suddenly start building new schools, uh, you know, when you're, uh, when you give, uh, when you give hundreds in, of millions of dollars in contracts to private vendors, uh, the private contractors to provide custodial services and engineering services, despite the fact that they get a 73% failure rate on the schools that they clean, you're not investing in the community. I, and, and then, of course, you know, I spoke uh, in the first uh, in the first portion of the interview about the total lack of investment on the west side and on the south side. So. My approach has always been to, to allocate resources in a way so that we're actually investing. And, and, and what happened in the schools was, our goal was to replace these obsolete buildings with state-of-the-art buildings. All those prefab schools that were built in the 1960s to keep the community segregated on the west side, I built state-of-the-art schools. I built, when they did the north side college prep, I did south side college prep at Gwendolyn Brooks in the Bronzeville Military Academy, in the Bronzeville community. But my goal in the Chicago Public Schools was to invest in programs that would make the schools more attractive. So our enrollment grew by 30,000 during that period. Since my departure, enrollment in the public schools, the city-run schools, has declined by 70,000. You're not investing. And when your schools decline, you lose more state money. When you lose more state money, the schools get worse. And that's what we're doing in the city. When you're not in investing in safe neighborhoods, when you're not investing in infrastructure to improve the infrastructure, I mean, something as minimal as making sure that we're getting the lead out of the drinking water. When you're not investing, uh, in, in, when you're not providing the type of economic development investments, so you're developing areas that are underdeveloped and that have been going through decades of decline, when you're taxing, when you're imposing a, a type of punitive tax and fee system, I mean, do you realize that from the fees and fines alone, there were 10,000 bankruptcies mm -hmm. resulting from just fees and fines, and 80% of those bankruptcies, 80% of those bankruptcies were in predominantly African-American wards, mm -hmm. or that in a single year, they suspended 21,000 licenses, or they asked to suspend the licenses, overwhelming overwhelming number in the minority wards and in the poor communities. I mean, imagine taking someone's license away yeah. because they can't pay a, 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 a fine. How did they get to work? How did they provide for their families? So, a lot of these things are often um, labeled as being mismanaged. 
I tend to believe that they are not being mismanaged, that they're being run and operated exactly as they were designed yes. to, that they're very intentional about what they're doing and where they choose to do it. So when you're talking about the, the, the financial hardships that, that many black communities face on the south side, on the west side, or just poor communities in general in this city, it's very intentional. It's done very deliberately as they continue to expand downtown and push further, push, push the west loop further onto the west side and push the south loop further into the south side. Absolutely. These things are intentional. And so you're talking about um, driving out of the, the people who've been in these communities for years and years and years, driving them out. How can we stop that where we're forcing so many people out of this city? Well, well let me just say this first. Uh, first, you're absolutely right. They, they are developing certain areas at, and, and you know, one could say, well, you know, they're developing areas where developers want to invest in, but uh, at, while they're ignoring the other areas, while well, developers don't want to invest in those other areas. But, but you know, and, and first of all, that's bad enough. That's atrocious mm -hmm. in its own right. But what they're also doing, and we've seen an example of it in the past couple of months, is they're actually transporting polluted businesses mm -hmm. and institutions to the south side. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to do a $230 million park on the north side, and they're going to move fleet management, the polluted fleet, fleet management facility to Englewood, I think at the old Kennedy King campus, mm -hmm. and they call that economic development. Or, or, or the most recent incident where they're moving that plant that, the, to the south side, that that's uh, that has that generates all sorts of pollution mm -hmm. so they can free up property so they can free up property and i think it's goose island for development mm -hmm. i mean so not only are they neglecting the south and west sides but they're moving their junk to the south right. and west sides and, and and you know i don't want to get into a kind of a war a, a you know these things my comments are not uh, about dividing the city or 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 pitting rich against poor, affluent mm -hmm. developed areas against underdeveloped areas. No, no, it, the fault falls on City Hall because there are the resources to go around. There are plenty of resources to go around. Mm -hmm. Take it from somebody who has but balanced 15, 16 multi-billion dollar budgets, who has taken over school districts and municipalities in severe financial distress, and not only found a way to redistribute resources, but to do it in a way that, that uh, also allowed us to, not to just hit people with uh, punitive, confiscatory taxes and fees. You know, when I ran the Chicago Public Schools, one example, we spent $3.2 billion on, on school construction. We built 78 school buildings. I allocated 54% of all contracts to minority businesses and I were, and 58% of all the construction hours, mm -hmm. $1.78 billion was performed by minority workers. The point that I want to make is mm -hmm. it's, it's about fairness. There is a lack of fairness, and I think it's intentional. I believe Absolutely. it's intentional. And I think it's the same way when you talk about education, when you talk about finances. Really quickly, we got about two minutes we need okay. to wrap up, but you, you, you touched on the police department really um, earlier, and I wanted to get a little bit more on that. You talked about education, finances, the police department is the other issue. How do you feel about the, the way our city is policed and how it can improve in about a minute? Yeah, well, 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 very quickly, you know, you can't have accountability without having enough sergeants and training officers and training and equipment. And, and when you're moving police around all over the city for every hotspot mm -hmm. and you don't have what, what is called beat integrity, you have a fixed number of police in the community who know the community, who not only know the people in the community, but the people in the community know who those officers are, that's critical. That's, that's a critical to community policing. That's critical to accountability. But I'll tell you something, something else really important. We can really transform our police department long term if the next generation of police officers come from the community. Mm -hmm. And you know the excuse, oh, you know, we can't recruit enough minorities. They can't pass the exams. When I ran to Chicago Public Schools, I opened seven, uh, five military academies, and f there were 42 ROTC programs, 11,000 ROTC cadets, 87% of them are minority. Well, there's a whole generation of future police officers and firefighters and first responders that can be recruited from within that population. Sounds so great. so nothing can have a more transformational effect than having officers in the community who are from the community, who know the community, who don't have to be acclimated to the community. Sounds very good. He is Paul Vallis. He is the mayoral candidate for the city of Chicago. Mr. Vallis, thank you for your time. No, thanks. Thank you.
He's gone from gang member to mentor for troubled youth. Harry Porterfield says Marcus Jones is someone you should know. Ultimately, uh, I made a bad decision, but the lure of the streets is so overwhelming. You just Marcus Jones ran track at Hales Franciscan and played football at Kenwood Academy. What did the street life involve? I joined the gang. Uh, is, it, it involved selling drugs. I thought that I was going to actually make a million dollars in the streets. And that's what the street life is. It's the quick, instant gratification right there. It really does not work out that way. People wanted to get at me because I was making money, you know. So I then had to show that uh, I was a tough guy. And that decision changed the rest of his life. Tell us about uh, April 17, 1995 at 7.49 a.m. We entered another drug dealer's home, attempting to rob him, and he got the ups on us. My buddy, he said that dude has a gun. I got shot two times, the drug dealer. And he stood over me and he told me that uh, I should kill you. And he shot me two more times. They took me to the hospital and I was terrified. And finally, the doctor came in and told me that I'd never be able to walk again. He served a 10-year jail sentence for armed violence and has been in a wheelchair for 20. Now he wants others to learn from his mistakes. He works for the Black Star Project, offering tutoring, mentoring, and workforce development to low-income black and Latino communities. I love the youth. You know, I love to speak to them. You know, I go into uh, the schools and, and do a motivational speaking and tell them about my life and, and tell them that, you know, hey, you don't want to be in this here. You don't want to be in this chair. <laughs> Marcus Jones, a former gang member, who has turned his life around, and he is someone you should know. This is the book that he has written, and it is called uh, Everyone Has a Story. This is mine, he says, and you can find it on Amazon. It really is incredible when someone turns their life around. Usually, they're the ones that can really reach so many other youth that are already going down that path. That's true. He was shot four times before he did it. And you hope that somebody like that, who's been through that, can somehow make an impact on the people that are doing it right now because they don't yes. like to listen to most people do that. He can relate. Yes, he can. All right, thanks. Thank you.